So my name is Mike O'Neill and, and welcome to uh, Landing Zones Can Help Build a Well-Governed AWS Cloud. What exactly does that mean? We're going to get into this because uh, I'm going to talk to you a lot about what my customers are telling me, uh, some of the experiences that they're having, some of the trends that we're seeing. And I mentioned before that, that, that this is really um, going to be a technical session. It's for beginners as well as advanced, so it's all levels. Um, the agenda, what I really want you to notice about this agenda, one to two minutes tops on who we are, 30 seconds on who I am, 30 seconds on what this seminar is, and then 60 full minutes of technical discussion. This is not supposed to be a sales type of thing. And by the way, we're doing this on a regular basis. Um, so when you registered, if I can look through all my windows here, I should have a window open to Fuji. And of course, now I don't see it. Let me go to, here we go, to Google. And if I jump over to the uh, uh, Fuji site, there we go. And I know you can't see that. When you logged in, you should be able to go to the Fuji technical sessions and see that we're doing tons and tons of sessions. It's not just um, about Azure or AWS. We're doing uh, 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 DevOps, we're doing business process engineering, we're doing data analytics. Um, I'm hoping that you'll come back again and again and again to these sessions. They're completely free, they're just for your benefit. And, and the reason we do this is we just want you to know that Fuji has this skill, right? We can help you from a consulting standpoint and from, from uh, driving your business forward. So <clears throat> who's Fuji? We got three locations. We are headquartered in the United States. I'm at our headquarters office, which is uh, working from home right now, but we're in Dallas, Texas. Um, so we are, are based there. We have about 600 employees worldwide. We have near shore facilities in Costa Rica so that we're on the same time zone as Dallas. We're in central time. We could do managed services and support um, uh, around the clock. And we also have offshore uh, resources in India as well. Established in 2014, you can read this, tons of engineers, data scientists, you name it. Great, great company to be a part of. What do we do? We do four things. We do uh, product engineering, quality engineering stuff. This is all the low code, no code, business process development stuff. It all kind of falls in that bucket. We do cloud, we can help you migrate, we can help you provide services, we do manage services. We have a whole security arm. We just built out this giant uh, facility down in Costa Rica and we're running our own security operations center, which will be online here shortly. And we're doing data engineering, data analytics, data pools, data factories. What's great about this slide is what we don't do. Um, and the thing I love about Fuji is we don't raise our hand and say yes to every opportunity that comes on. If you say, I need accounting help, we are not going to volunteer because that's not our strength. I call it staying in your swim lane. And, and we know where our swim lane is. We know what we're really good at. And what we're not good at, we build relationships with other partners. And it isn't just kind of a friendly we know. We actually understand their product. We've assessed it against others. And then we will uh, uh, recommend to you people that we feel very confident have the same passion for our customers as, as we do. So it's not just a handoff to some random person. It's someone that we know does a really, really good job. So here's what we do. And again, what we don't do, we are not gonna volunteer for it. We're gonna stay in our swim lane. We're gonna do what, what we do best. Who am I? You can read this. I'm an ex Microsoft guy. I was at Microsoft for 18 years. I helped build and run the seminar division of Microsoft for about 12 years. Um, you can read all this stuff. The, the crazy thing is I'm still engaged by Microsoft. They still uh, pull me back as a contractor and we do different events for them, different things. Um, so you, you may be asking, well, why is the Microsoft guy delivering an AWS uh, seminar? And the answer is uh, Fuji is vendor agnostic. I mean, we're very strong proponents of Microsoft, no question about it, but we also do AWS and we also do Google and we also have people on board that came from Oracle and the Oracle cloud. And our job is to find the right tool for whatever the customer needs. So um, I just want you to realize, yes, I am not, I have very deep experience with Microsoft, but I've spent two months now really getting into AWS and I love it. It's phenomenal. It is as good as, as what Microsoft has uh, it's a question of what works best for our customers. You'll never hear me bash. Even when I worked at Microsoft, you'd never hear me bash another competitor over, over Microsoft. Microsoft's got some great stuff. They're not perfect. Amazon got some great stuff. They're not perfect. 
we're going to help you figure out which which makes the most sense. Quick trivia question. I'm just wondering if anyone knows this. The percent of customers, and this is based on real data. I've been taking this survey. I've been working with customers for a while, so I know this is absolutely uh, 100%. What do you think the percent of customers out there, enterprise customers that are going multi-cloud? Use your chat window if you can. So just pull up your chat window real quick. Um, you should see it in the interface. And, and just type in what you think that percentage might be. Is it 10%, 20%? How many customers have multi-cloud in their environment? Meaning they're not all Microsoft or they're not all AWS or Google. They have a little bit of both. What percentage do you think that might be? And either I'm not understanding how this works or no one's answering. So type your chat message up and say, uh, what percent? Percent, okay? And see if someone can chat back and see if someone can get close to what they think the percentage is. Is the chat working or is the chat not working? Or have you all already gone to sleep? There, 50% says, oh, well, Eric, <laughs> you can't do that. You're part of the deal. And you're wrong, too. It's actually higher than that. All right, I'll keep going. There we go. Veronica says 70. She's cheating as well. It is 70% is exactly right. Um, so what is the main difference between when do I use AWS versus Google versus Microsoft? I can certainly tell you from the Microsoft perspective, if you are deep in Microsoft technology, meaning you already have Office 365, Microsoft 365, SharePoint, Teams, et cetera, there are some definite advantages to keeping in that Microsoft framework. So what customers do, even when they're multi-cloud, is they will uh, uh, make sure that they also uh, uh, take all the Microsoft related workloads and keep them in the Microsoft cloud. And then for other stuff outside of the Microsoft domain, that's when they'll run uh, AWS or Google or whatever. That typically seems to be the case. Um, but no problem if you are multi-cloud. By the way, Microsoft uh, um, also works with a partner that we work with at Fuji called CoreStack. CoreStack is a phenomenal tool that lets you manage multi-cloud all through a single pane of glass. And I have a technology session coming up where I'll be demoing the CoreStack interface and let you see how you can look at all your security and manageability from a single application that's looking both at AWS and Google and Microsoft and pulling all the results under uh, a single pane of glass. Again, something we don't do, but we found a partner that's really, really good at it. So anyway, that's my background. What are these things, these Fuji Expert Connect? We changed the name because the, the word webinar is way overused and it's kind of been poisoned, right? There's a lot of lousy webinars out there. And I hope this isn't gonna be one of them. We did this last week, we actually got perfect scores. So everyone gave us the highest rating possible. Hopefully we'll, we'll repeat that this week. Um, but I'm trying to make it also be interactive. I want people to respond and ask questions. I wanna give you as much insider knowledge as possible. Again, that's why Eric's here. He's got uh, quite a lot of experience with AWS. He can help me uh, answer it. And by the way, don't let my being relatively new to AWS dissuade you from understanding that Fuji has 600 people, many of whom are, are AWS senior architects, right? They're senior cloud specialists. We're very deep in that. Um, and so uh, even if I don't understand something specific that you might ask, we'll get you an answer. We'll make sure we get the, the right technical people to do that. Okay, and, and as much technical discussion. So let's just get into it. I always love this. This is a slide I've used before. Um, this is, uh, if you go back to, to my early days at Microsoft, I was a systems engineer. We would show up at a client's uh, site and on-prem, we'd walk into the server room and we'd see this mess of cables that you see to the left. And we'd immediately know, all right, just kill the whole week, right? It's pandemonium. You can't figure out what's connected where and why and anything uh, at all. And so what we start doing is ripping out all the wires and then we'd build a schematic and we'd figure out what's supposed to be going. And we'd ask the question, is this even connected to anything? Do we even need this wire? Eventually, we would build a system similar to what's on the right. Everything's color coordinated. It's bundled. It's labeled. It has a purpose. Well, this metaphor that I'm using here for networking is the exact same metaphor we want to use for governance. Governance is taking your cloud deployments, no matter which platform you deploy on, and making sure that everything has a purpose and everything's labeled and everything's color coordinated and structured and you have manageability and cost accounting applied over this. 
Now, I want to talk for a second about this, and, and Eric, you can chime in if you have uh, any feedback on this. But um, what's happening right now with all the customers, go back two years ago, we were faced with the pandemic, right? Uh, suddenly, companies that had five-year plans to eventually evolve to the new technology, go to cloud, get all this, those five-year plans got compressed down to usually two to three months because everyone suddenly had to work from home and IT departments were scrambling like mad to support this. Well, what happened is they inadvertently and, and understandably, they set up their cloud like this, right? They were just throwing up resources and doing everything they could to get people back online, to allow work from home, but they really didn't have a plan. They really didn't put all this stuff in place because it was such a compressed time frame. We all heard cloud's gonna save us money. Cloud's gonna you know, help us be more productive and allow us to expand. And it does some amazing things, but you probably figured out by now when you get your cloud bill that it isn't saving you money. In many cases, it's costing you 3X the time you thought it was uh, in cloud spend. You're getting hit with these massive bills. Why is that? And the answer is, because we didn't have the time to put all this governance on top of it. When we have gone in and I've worked with organizations that have sat down with customers, gone through workshops, we provide these workshops as well, where we can show you how to put governance on, cost controls on everything, we can reduce the monthly spend by three times what it is currently. Because I'm gonna show you how easy it is to get in this jumbled mess over here, and the point of today in talking about landing zones is to give you a way to snap it all back together and get some control. And as I was talking to June before the session started, she brought up some really good, good points. Everything I'm teaching you, you can do yourself. You do not need Fuji to do it for you. You do not need a third party. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do it yourself. However, many, many customers want a partner who can help them, who can consult, who can look over their shoulder and advise them you know, we've done it so many times, we know where all those potholes are. And, and we argue it's kind of like a Sherpa when you're going up Mount Everest, right? We can tell you exactly which path to take so you don't hit these potholes or run into trouble or whatever the case may be. And we're glad to do that for you. So how do we do all this stuff? Well, let's look at the common mistakes in AWS. Um, and I'm just gonna go through these real quickly. By the way, not to scare you, I have 67 slides and I hate slides. I wanna get as much live demo as we possibly can, but I put a ton in here for your reference. So you're gonna get a copy of this slide deck. You're gonna see some of these slides I zoom through in a matter of seconds with reference material for you to use later. I'll point them out, but there's a lot of data here. It's a lot of good data for you. You'll get that data, um, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna belabor each slide, uh, so we'll be skipping over some. This one though is really important. Uh, not understanding the cost, just what we talked about. The cloud is not always cheaper. Um, the one area that usually costs more is when you start getting into data and online databases and data factories and, and setting those up correctly. If you don't do it, it's going to cost you more than if you just ran it on-prem. Um, in many other areas, if you have governance, it actually will lower your bill. Um, not optimizing your resources and oversizing VMs, this works the same way. VMs are virtual machines, so the ability to set up a server in the cloud. You get a tech nerd like me or Eric, and you let us play in the cloud, we're gonna start throwing out virtual machines, and it's gonna ask us, well, how much memory do you want? I don't know, I can have, uh, 36 gig of RAM, let's put 36 gig in there, right? I'm not paying the bill. How many cores do you want? How many CPUs, you know? And so we're just picking and choosing and oftentimes we will way oversize this. And I've got an example and I apologize, this is kind of a US centric view, but hopefully everyone will understand. In the United States on October 31st, we celebrate Halloween. Kids dress up in costumes and they go around trick or treating, they get candy from everyone. If we're a company that sells Halloween costumes or just costumes in general, our business looks a lot like this chart, right? We have a little kind of tinking along, just doing a bunch. And then as we get close to October and the end of October on the 31st, we have 95% of all of our sales happen within about a three week period of time. And then as soon as Halloween is over, man, it goes right back down to almost nothing. 
the point of cloud is if I were to build this on-prem, I would have to spec this server for a worst case scenario. In other words, I gotta buy CPUs and processors and everything that can handle this massive load that I'm going to get in October, but the other 11 months of the year, I'm gonna not be using any of the CPU and the memory and the other stuff. Eric, you got something you wanna add? Sure, yeah, and, and that's uh, certainly one of the benefits and that's the, the major um, scenario for cloud, right? You wanna scale up, if you, if you had this in-house, you basically have to have this gigantic server that will be idle most of the time. And uh, again, the, the one thing to consider, again, going back to the mistakes, is that um, the cloud gives you this capability of scaling up, but you also need to make sure that you're configuring it properly so that it scales down once again, in this case, uh, on November 1st, right? Uh, so the cloud can be cheaper, it needs to be configured properly. Do I have to watch that, Eric? So if I'm if I'm setting up AWS, I gotta sit there all the time and say, do I need more, do I need less, or is that something that can be programmed? It's something that definitely can be programmed. It can be, uh, again, configured to uh, uh, scale based on demand. And once the demand goes out, then it can scale down and go to, again, a, a minimal a minimal setting. So it's just and a matter of configuration. I'm asking question facetiously because I have slides that are going to show you exactly how to do that. But I'm sure people are saying the same thing. So these are, these are problems that we have. Uh, cloud security, boy, you go to that scrambled mess that I showed you, it is so easy to accidentally create holes in your cloud network. And we have done, and Eric, I know you're directly tied to this, we're doing security audits for people where we just come in, we set up some software, we set up some monitoring, and literally in uh, under an hour, all of a sudden we start getting reports, penetration tests, things of that nature that come back and the customer's like, no way, I have no idea I had that many holes in my network. So let's help you identify them and then go close them down and, and keep you secure. June again was talking about, you know, uh, ransomware and problems and issues that are plaguing a lot of customers. They often come about because people don't realize they have these type of security holes. One more thing I wanna talk about here, this one's really important, the bottleneck between those who wanna create services in the cloud and the cloud management teams at organizations. And there is a fight that goes on. Now I've, I've done 57 um, uh, cloud services customers. I've taken them through workshops and other stuff. And I asked this question and without, without any hesitation, this always is the case. Everyone agrees this is happening. I have some developers and they wanna put up a database because they're building a new cool web app which allows, allows my employees to log invoices or whatever remotely, whatever they come up with. So they need a server that runs with a database out in the cloud. And so they ask for permission and they come and they say, we need a server. And the cloud team says, okay, fill out this form. How much memory, how much processor? They fill it out, they submit it. The cloud team says, no, this is way too big. You don't need this. And they fight back and forth and back and forth. You need security, you gotta follow this policy. What about compliance? And it just keeps going, going, going. On average, Gartner, IBM, all the main players have studied this and they are saying that in enterprise accounts, this back and forth war that goes on generally lasts six weeks. And it's just killing time, it's killing productivity, it's taking forever to get these apps out and available. What we're gonna show you today is a way to do all this automation. We're gonna automate the security. We're gonna set up policies. We're gonna do naming conventions and resource tags and we'll throw all this stuff in. And if you can get all that governance applied, we can actually turn around where we give our teams options to say, hey, I wanna spin up a database for a web app. And it'll say, here's a good, better, best solution for you. Which one do you want? You pick the one that you want and the program will automatically not only generate the resource, but apply that good governance across the top of it. So my cloud management team doesn't have to worry. It's a difference of six weeks if I do this battle back and forth versus five minutes. If I click the button, I know it's already approved. I know it's already following the right scripts. And I know when it comes out, all my security holes will be plugged. My maintenance, my cost management will be applied. Everything will work just perfectly and I'll have that web server up and running in a very, very short amount of time. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Your microphone's still not working. <laughs> All 
All right, well, let's see. Is there a question in the chat is what you're telling me? Okay, she says, yes, I'm looking at chat and I don't see, maybe it's under questions. Yeah, there's one question from June Clay it says, uh, oh, what cloud ahead. recommended for Intuit, QuickBooks and QCan? Okay, June, do you wanna ask your question real quick? I, I didn't get the full question there, I apologize. Can we turn on? There you go, June, your microphone's on. Oh, great, thank you. Um, for Intuit's QuickBooks and uh, Quicken, I like to keep my financial systems on one system. Mm -hmm. um, what? So I've been using Intuit, uh, Intuit Data Protect because it is, you know, connected with the desktop. Yeah. And yeah. Quicken, nah, I think it's Dropbox. Um, but uh, what would you suggest I use in the cloud for uh, for that solution? Because I'm changing everything now. Yeah, great question. I actually have a slide that I can show you exactly how this will come about. So hold on one second. I think it's only two slides away. Because um, what we're going to talk about is the AWS security model. And what does AWS protect for you versus what do they expect you to protect? And it kind of shows, especially when you talk about third-party solutions, Quicken, QuickBooks, et cetera, uh, how we might be able to set that up. Um, I think it's just a couple slides. So let me let me knock through these real quick and I'll speed this up. We're, we're spending too much. Why do you need governance? Look at the data here. I'm not gonna talk through all of this, but just tons of money is being wasted by companies because they're not optimizing, they're not governing these uh, resources. I may have a server, I turn the server on, it turns out that people only use that service during the day and at seven o'clock at night, everyone logs off, goes home, and that server just sits there billing time all the way to the next morning when people finally come back. Well, Eric is a genius, he can actually write a little policy that says, you know what, we're gonna gracefully shut that machine down every night at 7 p.m and we're gonna reboot it up at 5 a.m. the next morning, and we're not gonna to have to pay for that because these cloud services will only bill while the service is running. So if you don't use it, if you turn it off, they're not expending it. So a lot of these companies are wasting tons of money just because they, they have inefficient utilization or optimization of these resources, and they're being billed even though the server is doing absolutely nothing, just sitting there um, waiting for someone to use it. People come, people leave, I get orphan servers, I, I fire up a bunch of cool servers, I'm doing it, and then I leave the company and go somewhere else. And no one realizes that I have all these things running that are charging and billing in, against my organization that we don't need anymore because I'm not there. So we need a way to organize, we need a way to optimize and get reports back and say, show me everything Mike O'Neill was working on and gracefully let's shut down all of those servers. Or if the servers are needed somewhere else, Let's find a new owner and let's make sure it's all done. So you can see some of the data. Again, I hate reading slides for people, but man, you look at these numbers, they're pretty crazy. 77% um, of organizations believe that governance is important, but only 37 have actually implemented it. That's a huge, huge problem. So we're using this type of free uh, uh, seminar to help you out. So what is Amazon doing? What is AWS doing to do this? Now, I couldn't find a recent one. This only goes through about uh, 2020, but what they're showing here is how much that they have added in tools and services to help organizations get control of this. And it's coming at a faster and faster pace. This is basically a hockey stick, right? Where um, Amazon has put so much investment in this and they're putting in new tools, Control Tower and CloudWatch and uh, you know all these amazing tools. If you're new to Amazon, like I was, since I came from Microsoft, it can be really overwhelming. You look at these pages and there's just hundreds and hundreds of tools and trying to figure out which one fits where uh, can be daunting. Just in the last five years, they've released 450 different tools. So what I'm gonna do today and Eric, with Eric's help, we're gonna help you bucket these tools into logical groups that'll help you get your brain around it, help you get your organization on track, and we're gonna show you how they apply to a landing zone, which can help you create and build and deploy some of this governance stuff. Okay, 
Last thing here, this is also, every time you see these black bordered things, these came directly from AWS. So I didn't make these up. These are from Amazon themselves, but they're talking about where our customers heading. They are going cloud native, right? And why do you want to go cloud native? Cloud native means I'm going to build for the cloud rather than take everything I had and try to move it up. Uh, I'm going to just start over and rethink the whole thing. And you can see faster code deployments, lower failure rates, quicker times, all this amazing, incredible, cool stuff. But it brings up a, a huge question, which is, is lift and shift dead? And I made this comment to Eric, and I made this comment to our, our senior cloud super guru, and I was taken to school because I said, hey, lift and shift is dead. Amazon's talking about this. Microsoft's talking about this. No one's going to do lift and shift. When we say lift and shift, we mean just take your existing on-prem infrastructure and just move it up to the cloud. And a lot of organizations did this and a lot of partners advertised the ability to lift and shift, right? And what they're now saying is, well, no, 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 you really shouldn't do that because there might be a lot of garbage in there. A lot of us have files that are old and they need to be removed and deleted. And there's all these kind of old dependencies. And if we lift and shift, we're going to pick those dependencies up and we're just going to move those problems now into our new, nice, clean, optimized cloud. And that's a terrible idea. And so I was so smart. I was like, lift and shift is dead. And you know, we don't want to do that. And they took me to school. Eric, why did you guys take me to school on lift and shift? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, in this case, I think it's very similar to, uh, let's say, if you're uh, moving from your current house, your current apartment to another one. So ideally you wanna go through your stuff, go through your furniture, go through your uh, clothes and figure out what's all, what you're no longer gonna use and get rid of it or give it away, right? And, and just move what you want, what the, the things that are more efficient, perhaps the new place has a better stove or a better AC. And so you wanna accommodate to that. That would be the ideal scenario and that again is the equivalent of re-architecting for the cloud and building cloud native. But there are times when you're in a rush, right? And you need to move things as, as fast as you can. So, uh, and perhaps going through that process of reviewing what you have and reviewing again and, and getting rid of all the dependencies may take a while. So there are scenarios where you do wanna just lift and shift, take what you have. And then once you're in the cloud, then you can optimize and start getting rid of the things that are no longer being used or again, are, are um, maybe duplicates or there are better, better options in, in the cloud. So there's still a scenario for lift and shift, again, especially when it comes to, again, moving as fast as, fo as possible. And again, sometimes companies just, they may have a contract coming up of the uh, expiring for their um, data center, and they, they just want to move to cloud quickly. And, and knowing that, again, going through the process and reviewing and, and becoming more optimized will take months. So there's still a scenario where it's still, um, valid to, to do lift and shift and then but obviously keep in mind that once you move to the cloud you still want to optimize because again you don't want a cost to go to go overboard I, I love that analogy and this is absolutely true my brother moved uh houses recently got the moving van moved everything and once they got to the new house then they had a garage sale to get rid of all the junk that they should have done <laughs> before they moved but your point is, is exactly the case. And we've been talking to a number of financial organizations that are like, I have to get compliant. I need compliancy now. The easiest way to get compliancy is to go to the cloud and put these policies on. We'll show you how to do this today. And they're like, I can't wait. Help us move. And then once we get that set up, we'll go backwards and we'll clean up and we'll optimize and we'll organize. So it just depends on the customer. Lift and shift is not dead, although optimally, just as Eric said, we'd love to kind of get the cleanup and the organization done beforehand, but we can work either way. So something to think about as we kind of go through this. So Amazon has put these into um, kind of these buckets, enable, provision, operate. And these are the different tools that you'll see when we go out to Amazon and we look at our cloud. And I'm just gonna go do that real quick. Let me go back here and I have signed in to AWS. Um, and so this is the, the Fuji AWS uh, um, uh, uh, domain. This is, this is where we put our stuff. I'm gonna tell you, this is also a bit of the cobbler's son. Uh, and if any of you know that analogy, right? The cobbler is the guy who makes the shoes. He makes brilliant, or she makes brilliant, beautiful shoes for everyone. 
but their children are running around barefoot, right? So uh, here we are teaching people how to use good governance. And I went in yesterday and I noticed it's about half and half. Some of these are really well governed and some of these are not so well governed and I need to talk to my team and uh, help the cobbler figure out how to, how to make sure everyone's got a good pair of shoes on. Um, but anyway, th these are the exact kind of things we're talking about, the, the um, resources that AWS provides, and I can see which ones I'm currently working on and building stuff into. And any one of these I can click on, like here's AWS organizations. We're gonna talk about this in just a bit. And you can see deployments, exceptions, all this, this stuff is in here. This is actually how AWS recommends that you set up your organizational structure. You don't have to, but they've given you some guidance, they've given you some best practices, so I've designed that as well. So these are the individual tools you use to manage and monitor and control your AWS environment. What this session about today is what are the best practices, tips and tricks, the well-architected framework that's gonna help you kind of put this all into some cohesive plan. So uh, let's go back to the PowerPoints. Now that you understand that's what this is. So here they have bucketed no problem, in. Michael. Someone has a question? Yeah, you can check a chart like it does mention. Um, I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. In the chat, I have put a couple of questions by audience. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, why can't we go for RI instances? Eric, you got that one? Uh, yeah, you're talking about reserved instances. So yeah, this, definitely there are some improvements that can be made for cost. Uh, again, a reserved instance is basically a commitment uh, where you're saying you're gonna use this server for X amount of time, that's gonna give you some savings. But again, going back to the scenario where the server is not used overnight, there's still maybe a, a, a more optimal approach to, on saving, again, saving costs by just having a policy on that server that it stops overnight. So again, with, uh, there are some scenarios for reserve instances, basically those cases where you do need to have a server running 24 seven, but, um, but yeah, it definitely de depends on the scenario. And, and I do have a slide coming up that talks about from Amazon, how there's a number of ways to save money. Reserve instances is one of them, for example. And by the way, June, I haven't forgot. I, I do have that slide coming up. I haven't forgot your question. Um, there's just a lot we have to get through. Uh, but yes, there, there's a number of things that you can go through, uh, the way you set up your databases, the way you set up things that you can use special uh, cost efficiency from Amazon, if you're willing to, to take the you know uh, occasional hit to operations or or uh, availability or whatever, uh, Microsoft does the same thing. They'll they'll allow you to to use some of those reserve instances and controls for that. One thing I do want to point out, this is just a note, but I thought it was interesting. AWS has really gotten focused on governance and guidance, but they only started in 2020. Um, so they beat Microsoft by a wide margin getting to cloud, but it's only recently that they've kind of started bucketing this. And I see our other question is talking about the six R's methodology. Um, that's exactly where I'm going. So you're going to see this enable provision operate. I don't like this. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I wanted you to see it. And what I'm about to do is take all of this and switch it back to the, the six pillars uh, that AWS talks about and how we organize and structure this uh, uh, data. So this is just to show you what does this look like once we kind of get into this. Well, if we go through, and this is for your reference, I'm not going to go through all this right now, but we go back to enable, here's control tower and organizations and budget and license manager, well-architected tool. I want to go through each one of these and give you a simple definition of what they are, right? Um, we use Control Tower, for example, to build a well-governed landing zone. That's what this session is all about. And I'm going to show you about 16 slides that you're going to use as reference. We're not going to go through them today, but they will take you step by step on how to build and set up your own landing zones. And then we'll talk about the pros and cons and all of this. But here, this talks about what is AWS organizations, what is the well-architected tool, how do you set up budgets, and each one of these, here's provisioning, uh, a cloud formation, it's all about treating infrastructure as a code, I've marked a few of these, it's kind of extra interesting, 
CloudWatch and CloudTrail, we'll talk a ton about these from a log file perspective. Make sure you monitor your accounts and you know exactly what's going on. Um, we'll go into, uh, again, more of the operational stuff. So this is how they kind of set it up. Now, I put this slide in because I think this is important. If you are multi-cloud, you will hear the same terms used in Microsoft. They have completely different meanings. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me give you an example. Microsoft will talk about cloud adoption framework and AWS will talk about cloud adoption framework. Microsoft will talk about well-architected framework and so will AWS, but totally different um, what they're referring to. <clears throat> On the cloud adoption framework, in Microsoft's world, in Azure, it is a web collection of 2,000 pages of technical guides and best practices. Um, two weeks ago, I did this exact same presentation, but for Azure. And if you missed it, we're going to redo it. Uh, it was very popular. A lot of people loved it and requested that we bring it back. Um, so probably in the next couple of weeks, I will be adding more Azure sessions if you want to see that. Um, I wanted to show you just so you get a feel for, for what this is. Uh, if I go out here, this is the uh, cloud adoption framework. Let me jump back here. I'm just going to put Microsoft cloud adoption framework. There we go. You can find this just as easy. Um, you know it's the right one because it'll start with learn.microsoft.com. So the second one here, cloud adoption framework. This is 2,000 pages of documentation, best practices, tools, everything that you possibly could want. This is kind of the whole nut from Microsoft's perspective of how to build and run an Azure site, okay? That is not the same in AWS. They do have a cloud adoption framework, but it's not the same concept. So let me go back to my PowerPoints just to kind of make sure everyone's with me on this. So Cloud Adoption Framework in AWS is a single document on guidance for moving to cloud, and they take a perspective from business, people, governance, platform, security, operations, okay? So it, it's kind of a single document that's focused on this, and it's just a simple guide for moving. Where on the Microsoft side, this is everything. Then you look at well-architected framework. Well-architected framework in AWS is the whole big massive guide best practice it all has the aws architecture center uh, which i'll click on here just to show you what this thing looks like this is a great resource that will go out and it will take you up and show you examples and diagrams of architectures tons of videos so the well architected framework in aws is similar to the cloud adoption framework at the microsoft side on the Microsoft side, the well-adopted framework is what Microsoft refers to as the end result. It's the nirvana state where everything becomes self-managed and everything works like a dream. And what Microsoft says is it'll probably take you at least two years of tweaking and adjusting your Azure environment to get you into what they call well-architected, uh, okay? So same terminology, but very, very different meaning, meanings. And I'm sure you're probably saying, okay, this is as clear as mud to me right now. I will absolutely go deeper on this and kind of uh, give you some guidelines to show you how this comes out. One more thing, Microsoft always talks about blueprints. Blueprints are incredible um, pieces of code that help you automatically set stuff up. Uh, in AWS, Eric has been been really teaching me about partner solutions. They used to be called quick start guides. Eric, you want to explain what a partner solution quick start guide is and what it does? Absolutely. Yeah, these are pretty much examples in, uh, again, on particular uh, architecture implementations that are, are following best practices. Again, for example, uh, how to set up a photo monitor to see, again, the, the usage on your um, AWS, or if you're using workspaces, there's a uh, solution that you can just go in, click. There's going to be a, a, a cloud formation template that you can just use and implement in your instance. So basically, are just uh, best practice uh, scenarios you can, that you can just go in and implement and, and deploy in your instance. So same thing, June, you were talking about third party tools, or maybe you want to set up a, a web service or whatever the case may be. Others have already done this. They've already created guides, and you can use these kind of automated tools to get yourself kick-started. 
you'll, you'll answer a few questions and as you go, it helps you kind of build it out. So these are very similar, uh, but again, different names. So let's get into what it is. What we're really going to be talking about today as we talk about the landing zone is this well-architected framework. And as the question came in about the 6R methodology and, and, and uh, um, the different stuff, uh, this is really designed to show off the differences from an Amazon's perspective between building on-prem and moving to that cloud native. In other words, helping you think differently versus lift and shift. If I'm moving to cloud, what do I need to think about? And Amazon calls this out, quit guessing at your capacity. We're gonna show you, and Amazon does this well, you can throttle up and throttle down as needed. So I gave you the example of the Halloween costume shop. I don't have to spec my virtual machine for that worst case scenario. I can leave it down at the lowest levels and as I get to October and suddenly the demand starts coming in, I can set up some automation where as soon as I hit the 80% threshold on my resources, I can have it reallocate and give me more CPU and more memory and more processor. So I'm never down, I'm never having my customers wait in order to buy their, uh, their Halloween costumes. And then the next day on November 1st, when no one's gonna buy a costume ever again, it'll throttle right back down and it'll save me tons of money versus leaving it at that high high uh, rate and just eating the, eating the cost. Um, we also have the ability, this is huge. You know, if you're gonna do this right, you need to be able to test. You need a test environment, a dev environment, you need a production environment. But the problem is if I try to do this on-prem, it's impossible to build a test environment that's at production levels to see at the speed and the volume that I'm gonna get at production levels, it would cost so much money to set that up if I was working on-prem. But in the cloud, in AWS, I can actually build uh, mirrors if you want. I could, I could build a, a, a models that are exactly the same as production. I can stress test them. And because I only pay when that test is running, um, as soon as the test is over, I can shut it down. And now I, I, I've stress tested my system at full production and I can see exactly what kind of resources are gonna be needed based on the requirements of my production environment. Very, very hard to do if you're on-prem. Uh, I create the replicas of the environment, you got consistency. Um, the other thing in this last point is really huge. They are constantly coming out with new tools, new functions. We're starting to get a lot of AI stuff being built in. Uh, Microsoft and Google are both working on AI that monitors your spend inside of the cloud and will actually come back and make recommendations on how to save money. That sounds insane when you think about it. Microsoft is actually going to help customers and Amazon and Google. They're gonna help, excuse me, help customers to not spend money. Well, the reason they're doing this is because they're realizing if they don't, customers are gonna start leaving because their spends are three times what they thought they would be and because there's so much waste in it. So that's why there's so much focus from these huge cloud providers to help rein it in, help customers get better control, cost accounting, et cetera, so that you're not wasting money because if you waste a ton of money, it's very unlikely you'll continue subscribing into the future. I do have a link here. Again, you're gonna get these slides. And when you click on the link, this will take you out to the six pillars of a well-architected framework. Again, tons of information that I have for you. I've copied the main points into this PowerPoint deck. We're not gonna go through all of it, but you will have it for your information. Um, so I've already done the homework for you, if you will. Here are the uh, five slash six pillars uh, that's part of this well-architected framework. Why do I have this? Well, if you look at the slide decks from, from Amazon, and I've gone through a whole lot of these, um, the first parts of them are all the five pillars. And what's happened is Amazon added a sixth pillar, which is sustainability. But most of the slide decks still say five, and then lately you see a lot more of the six. So you're gonna see both. Uh, but these are them, security, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, operational excellence, sustainability. What does this mean? To get to a well-architected framework, to close all the security holes, to get your operational efficiency running where it should, and most importantly, to bring all your costs in control, you need to be thinking about these six things. And I'm gonna show you individually the, the tools involved 
in wrapping up your security? What do you need to do for reliability? What do you need to do for performance efficiency? And if you'll just go through these and utilize these tools, you'll you'll tighten up all those loose ends. We'll, we'll deploy a landing zone with good governance on it, and, and you'll move from that crazy wiring diagram into a well-organized and, and optimized environment. Uh, again, not going to read it, but these are there for you. Security is huge, and this is one of the biggest worries. That's why it's number one. We rushed to get out and support work at home and bring your own device and all that other stuff, and unfortunately, we have endpoints that are open we have security holes gateways dmz's all kinds of, of issues that could be potential uh, liabilities and if we apply good governance and rules and compliancy and all that stuff we'll close them all up really really fast so these are the things that you need to be thinking about getting traceability putting security at all levels there's tons of great best practices that you could see what other organizations have done it's all shared. We'll point you to those resources and show you how to do it. Or again, we'll come in and work with you if you need some help. Um, we'll run a workshop. We'll run a security check on everything uh, just so that you can sleep well at night knowing that it's all uh, closed up and, and good to go. This is the slide that I, I promised a, a long, long time ago. So June, this is what I was talking about, where uh, this AWS security model um, everything in orange is what Amazon says, look, we got this. We own the security for compute, storage, database, networking, for all the international regions, edge locations, et cetera. That's kind of baked into the AWS environment. The big worry, though, is this blue area, and that's where customers have to take over. Now, June mentioned using Dropbox or using you know, some of the existing stuff, and I know um, you mentioned uh, QuickBooks and, and that they want to sell you extra security platforms, et cetera. I'm not knocking it. If that works, that's fantastic. Um, but I think, as you just pointed out, there are issues with synchronizing those files and making sure everything's right. If we can get our cloud environment locked down and secure, then we can actually save those files in the cloud and also have uh, local versions and we can encrypt them and lock them and never have to worry about them. And the best part of this, if you set this up correctly, you can go anywhere in the world. As long as you have a web browser that can log in, I can get to those files. So the files basically travel in the cloud with you wherever you are. You can't lose it. You can't have it destroyed. The dog can't eat it. Uh, you can't, you know, if your computer blows up, your file is still going to be stored and backed up. Uh, because of, of this uh, uh, security built into the cloud. But you have your part to do. You have to think about your customer data, your application and access management, operating system, network, and configuration. And again, I'm going to show you the tools that are going to allow you to control all of this stuff. But Amazon says, we got everything in orange. Your job is to focus on everything in blue. And this is what they call the, the responsibility for security in the cloud. This is the customer's part of this. So what does that include? It includes data protection. It includes privilege management, it includes all these other stuff. And so what I did was I started to put in the tools that are gonna help you do this. CloudTrail, for example, you know, I could do a whole day class just on CloudTrail. We don't have enough time for this, um, but what it's gonna do is it's going to help you in detailed logging, it says longing, logging, uh, of all of your data to make sure that it's all being done correctly. Identity and access management, what they call IAM, and key management services, KMS, that helps you encrypt and manage your data. So you can put a security key on it and encode it. And so even if that file was stolen, no one could ever use it. S3, which is the storage solution in AWS, um, they have up to 11 nines of durability. What does that mean? It means you can put 10 thousand objects into an S3 database and store them for 10 million years and you can expect one error in that 10 million years worth of time. Basically it means you're never going to lose your data. It's, it's so uh, uh, secure. And you can see some of these come in again and again. Here's IAM and IAM privilege management. You're creating ACLs, access control list, password management, you absolutely have to put on multi-factor authentication. It is the fastest and easiest way to completely secure your network. Once you have this, all those other problems are going to go away. 
Um, and so we can't emphasize enough to make sure that you have this applied across your environment. VPCs, CloudTrail, CloudWatch, log monitors, alerts. So what I'm doing is I'm going through each one of these parts, this is still in security, and listing all the tools and what they're going to do to help you get this data locked down and, and in control. Um, and I show each one of those. And then we go to the second pillar, this is reliability. Uh, and I talk about, well, what does this mean? It means thinking about if I have a failure, how do I recover? Um, and in a test world, this is a great process to go through. You need to fail your network so you can see if your rollover procedures are working correctly. You can stop trying to guess at what kind of capacity you need. You'll see the loads coming through and you'll know exactly uh, how much to tweak those servers and where to put them and how to, how to run them, et cetera. And you can automate everything in this process, again, so that you're always up, you're always running, and if there is a failure, if something goes south, you have a system that's going to kick in automatically and back everything up and, and get you back up and running in no time. Um, so these are the tools. I can use CloudFormation here, which will launch temporary copies. You can actually create copies of your entire system. And if you have a failure, I can spring up a whole uh, recreation of my network and my environment and get it right back up and running as fast as possible. CloudWatch, you can do monitoring of data in case you have some kind of failure that's going on. Um, performance efficiency, again, not going to read you the slide, but just tons and tons of great data. And by the way, there are links to all of this back to the original source documents in the well-architected framework inside of AWS. Okay, So I just want to make sure I'm giving you the high-level data. There's tons of backup data to support all of this stuff, and you can read and see um, other uh, companies and what they're doing and how they're setting this stuff up. Um, performance efficiency. So uh, uh, AWS Lambda serverless execution. This is huge. One of the biggest things that AWS customers love is the ability to run serverless code. And you know what serverless code means is I can set up a, a system or a process that will run and execute without having to worry about, well, which server and how much memory and which processor and having to manage all that stuff. Lambda and AWS allows me to, to spin up a service. And let me give you an example. Uh, AWS uses this. I want, to, uh, I want to take photographs and I want to post them up into a storage in S2, I'm sorry, S3. Um, I want to post them up into a storage. And when they get posted, I want a process to realize there's a photograph there and automatically run and resize that photograph because I'm going to use it on the web or I'm going to upsize it and scale it or do whatever the fact may be. Um, that's a service that I want to provide my organization. So wouldn't it be great? Just tell people, hey, throw all your photos in here and it'll take over. AWS will do its magic. And when they come out on the other side, they'll all be resized exactly the way we want to. That's a serverless application. I don't have to manage that server. I don't have to pick all the particulars and everything else. Lambda, Beanstalk. Beanstalk is the exact same thing. It's a serverless application, but it's specifically designed to build web apps um, and, and websites. And then again, uh, S3 for storage. Uh, they also have a whole section on databases for performance efficiency. Uh, Amazon has its own uh, uh, relational uh, database, it's called RDS. Um, they also, if you need millisecond latency, you need the fastest speeds humanly possible because you're doing a commerce site with a million records, something like that, DynamoDB is a great option. Redshift is here, Aurora, AMI. Again, Amazon keeps coming out with new, cooler, better um, um, database technology. You get to pick the one that's right for your business. And if you don't need millisecond access and you don't need to scale up to you know, 50 quintillion uh, pieces of data, uh, you want to make sure you right size your database to the needs that you have. Allow for growth, but at the same time, don't put your cost through the roof because you oversized your database. So uh, there are some tools that can help you figure out what the right one is. As always, Fuji is, is standing by if you need us. We can help you uh, with our years of experience. We can tell you, you know, well, this customer is doing this. It's very similar. It works great. Um, we'll show you some examples of that. Cost optimization. This is absolutely huge. 
Um, you can set budgets. You can put in uh, an exact amount you want to spend per month, and you can come back and check against that. And you can put limiters that say, I'm not going to go, if I, I'll allow 10% over my budget. And after that, shut everyone off until someone comes in and says, yes, you're approved for, for greater budget. Um, I'm going to laugh because if we go back to the console here, I was looking at our budgeting uh, because we put some in. Now, a lot of this is solutions we're doing for our customers right now. And you can see budget forecasted end month, et cetera. So I went in and started looking at uh, some of the cost explorers. This is a tool that helps you look at your budgets and decide where you could save some money. Uh, so this is a great example. And uh, you can see uh, March of each year, right? March and April, we have these huge jumps because we have customers that are very specific to tax law and everything else. And then the rest of it kind of, you know, trails along. And um, what I was laughing at is we've blown our budget out uh, multiple times here. I think it's under the budgets or reports. Uh, I don't want to give away too much. Yeah, we've exceeded this three times already, and we're currently 141% of our budget versus what we've uh, forecasted will be. So even us has to go back and say, wait a minute, what's going on? We're overspending. Let's get it under control. Let's listen to the advisor from AWS, and it's going to tell us how to, how to put this stuff back into order. And it will look and, for stuff that's inefficient and, and help you fix it. Yeah, question? And, and Mike, just uh, a detail there. That I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, AWS and again, Azure, all the different providers are looking for, way to, for ways for customers to take care or, or ownership of their costs, right? Because especially with the cloud services, you're not notified upfront how much this is going to cost if you leave it running for a month. I mean, you need to do the research, and at the end of the month, you get the bill. So okay. with tools like AWS budgets, you can again set up different thresholds so that if you're going over 400 bucks or $2,000, then you get notified in advance, uh, so you can take preventive actions before you again go over budget. Yeah, one of the things we talked about uh, two weeks ago when we were talking about Microsoft and is, is this con concept of build back, show back, right? Um, I have a slide that uh, we're about to hit that talks about resource tagging. And if you set up resources, resources are any kind of service that I'm providing into my cloud, I can tag them with what are called named pairs. And I'm going to show you this in just a second. But the cool thing about tagging is I can tag anything I want in any way I want. So I may want to tag by department use. And I'm going to say, I'm setting up this resource for my marketing department. And this is for my sales group. And this is for IT. I can tag by the person. I could say, okay, Eric is setting this up, so I'm gonna tag it with Eric's name. I can tag it by the project or the cost code of the project. And you should use as many tags as you want. The reason I'm bringing this up is when we talk about cost optimization, I can do what's called a bill back or a show back where I could go to my marketing manager and say, hey, I'm IT, I'm providing all these services in the cloud, I just want to show you what marketing is using in the cloud services. And I can say generate a report where the tag equals division is marketing. And all the marketing spend comes out as one. And I can show it to the marketing manager and say, well, this is what you're spending. Are these all valid projects? Are you still working on this stuff? And my marketing manager goes, well, no, that one closed off two months ago. Okay, we need to shut that down because we're billing against that time. Or we can come back and say an individual person, like I said, Mike O'Neill left the company or whatever, show me all the stuff that Mike's working on using those tags, and I can actually start eliminating that, that wasteful cost that we've talked about. So I'll show you an example of that. I think it's coming up here. Yeah, it's the very next slide, actually. Um, cost optimization, here's some tools. Use that trusted advisor. Here's what we were just talking about. Someone brought up in the questions. On-demand instances, reserved instances, spot instances, these are all ways to save money if you are willing to, to um, meet the requirements of this where you're not up, you know, maybe as frequently or your response, uh, your SLA is, is a little delayed or whatever. Depending on how you do it, um, these can save you significant amounts of money. Microsoft, Google do this similar thing as well. Cost allocation tags, billing alerts. There's a simple monthly calculator that lets you try to figure out exactly what your spend's going to be based on the requirements. So it asks you a bunch of questions and you kind of fill it out. 
Um, and then they're coming out with tons of new optimization tools. Uh, Kinesis Firehose, Elasticsearch, Kinesis, QuickSight. Again, I have definitions of these in my uh, uh, documents that you'll have a chance to, to look at and get some deep discussions. This is that uh, optimization resource tag thing I was talking about. And just to show you, hopefully I'm not going to give away any company secrets here, um, but if I go back in, let's go back to the, the um, beginning. If I were to pull up a resource, um, let's say I have a, a virtual machine or I have something else running inside this and I want to look at my resources, um, I can go in and I can tag them. And I think what I'll do, just so I don't give away anything, because again, we do have some customer solutions running here and I don't want to accidentally share that with the whole world. So uh, this is how I would launch a new instance or build a new resource. So I'd give it a name. And of course we wanna use good naming conventions. We wanna make sure we put you know, what region, what project, what is it for, et cetera. So anyone looking at this, I could spin up what type of environment, including Ubuntu or Windows or Red Hat or SUSE or whatever you want. I could set exactly all the different configurations based on what I need. You need a really powerful server. You just need a simple website kind of thing. Um, so there's lots of different choices. And then I get down here to the, the key pair and the different uh, instrumentation. This is for, for networking and, and setting the key. Um, and if I go farther enough, I thought it was on this page, but it might be on the next one. It's going to ask me about this named pair deal. Named pair simply means you get to give it a category and you need to give it a value. Let me go back to my slides to explain this. Uh, if I go back here. So I've given some examples. So it's called a valued pair. It's the environment and the value that you're going to put on it. So I could say, I always want to know who is spinning up this resource. So I can go back and ask later. So Eric wants to, to put up a simple database. So he spins up a database. Well, at the time he creates that, I want him to put a tag. And the tag is going to be called creator or owner or any word you want. Doesn't matter. Just be consistent. But let's say, let's say we use owner. Eric would create an owner tag. And that's the first part of the named pair. And then it says, okay, what do you want to set the value of the owner tag to be? And he'll put Eric Vargas, right? And so what happens is that resource now is tagged to say the person that spawned this is Eric Vargas, which allows me later to set a filter and say, show me all of my owners whose name equals Eric Vargas. And that's how I generate that report of everything that Eric has done. But I could also put the department, like I said, the marketing department or the sales department. I could arrange it by cost center. I want to know what is the application being used for, right? I'm spinning up a SharePoint site or I'm sending up a, a test dev site or whatever. So I might put the application is accounting package, the customer is Fuji, the owner is, the role is, the project is, you can see all this. One that I really like that doesn't get used near enough, I think this is just the coolest idea, lifespan or you know expiration date, if you want to call it that. This allows you to say, I think I need to run this project. This is a year long project. You know, we're doing a United Way campaign. We're gonna raise money for the United Way. So I'm gonna spin up a server devoted to the United Way campaign. Well, I've set a lifespan on here and I set the date exactly one year from today. Cause I think at that point, this campaign's over and someone else is gonna take this project and run with it and may not need this resource. So I say lifespan equals, and I take today's date, which is the 18th. And I say, okay, it's going to be April 18th of 2024, exactly one year from today. And then we work and we do all the things we want to. Now, what you can do is you can set up reports that will look at these categories, these resources, tags, and they'll say, show me every lifespan that's past its end date. So show me everything whose lifespan has a date before today's date, meaning we've already gone past it. And it comes up and shows me and says, well, Mike said he only needed this for a year. It's now past its lifespan. And I can call Mike up and say, hey, according to, to what you filled out in the resource tags, you didn't think you were going to need this thing running anymore. Is this an orphan resource? In other words, is it just sitting out there billing time and no one's using it? I say, oh, no, 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 it really is. We're still using it. It's great. We wanted to keep it. The next project team decided to keep this going. 
not a problem. Just go into the resource tag and change the date. Put it another year out or two years or whatever you think it is. Or I answer and say, I totally forgot about this thing. I am so sorry. Yeah, we killed that project already. It's over and done. Great, then let's go close down those resources. There's no reason to be wasting money and resource time uh, for the company on something we're not using. But that happens a lot. And especially as I mentioned, this rush to get out, um, to kind of get ahead of COVID caused a lot of these types of problems. So hopefully this is making sense for you. Question? Mm -hmm. Mike, just, just uh, one detail there. Uh, AWS and uh, again, dear providers do have tools and they want to ha have you follow those best practices. So for example, for the resource tax, you could use AWS Config, uh, which is again a tool that is going to enforce rules. So for example, if you have this life, uh, lifespan uh, tag, you can create a rule that enforces that any new resource will need to have that tag. So that again, you have consistency and you can also create reports automated reports that will look for that lifespan tag and, and send an email and notify whoever. So yeah, there are tools that you can configure to enforce governance and to enforce that everybody is following the same practices so that there's no resource orphan there that nobody knows where it came from and how long it's supposed to last. Oh, that is such an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly right. Um, one of the problems, whenever I bring this up to companies, they're like, well, I can't force people to put tags in. Yeah, actually you can. You can build policies, you can use the tools, just as Eric said, to say, hey, if you're going to create a resource, we're going to force you to put in uh, the resource tags to make sure it gets uh, appropriately done. And in some cases, I know we do this on the Azure side, you could even have it look at the organizational structure and automatically build some of these resource tags without even asking the user. All of this applies governance, keeps it all well done, um, et cetera. I do see a lot of questions popping up. Are there questions we're missing in the chat window? I want to make sure I got these. And by the way, I'm running slightly long. We don't have a whole lot more slides. Uh, so if I'm rushing too fast, I apologize. I'm trying to get all this in. Uh, okay, there are a couple questions, Eric. If you want to look those over, I'm going to continue because we're almost done with the pillars. And then we'll go back and clear off those questions. Uh, pillar five is operational excellence. We kind of talked about this. Um, this is a big one. Operations as code. So try whenever possible to do code as a service, meaning automatically program stuff out, evoke these rules and policies, put some compliancy on, have things happen automatically so you get consistency, scalability, repeatability, all that can be done. Um, another one that I love is this make frequent, small, reversible changes. Um, keep it small, keep it easy, and whenever possible, so you can undo if something changes or you decide you don't need that. Um, again, there's tons of good documentation uh, upon all this. Learn from failures this is a, a huge best practice. You can read all about this. Here are the uh, tools that you would use to do this. So performing operations as code. Uh, defining workloads, applications, infrastructure with code, and allowing people uh, with proper procedure and proper authority can execute and automate a lot of the uh, creation and management and running of these uh, resources. Um, and then we go through this again, you can read through it all. Uh, you'll have this slide deck in which you can do that. The last one is the new one that they added, sustainability. It's just trying to think about our global and societal impact. Um, and so number one is understand what your impact is and then uh, think about sustainability goals. There are tools to help you do this. There are best practices that are shared out there, uh, but adopting and, and, and being more efficient. The, the more efficient you are, the better you're saving money, the better you're actually helping the sustainability argument. We're not wasting electricity. We're not uh, uh, spinning resources that we don't need. Um, so the more optimized you can get, the better off we're, we're helping the planet and helping each other um, as we put this together. This is going to grow. This is going to be an even bigger effort coming from AWS. They're putting lots of tools, lots of resources behind this, tons of training as well, just to make sure um, that we're doing everything we, we can possibly to, to keep sustainability as high as we can. So this is toward the end so great you just taught me all these tools and you just explained it but i still don't know what am i supposed to do in order to add governance well this is it we're going to enable governance at scale this is a step-by-step -step guide right here 
Number one, set up a landing zone. And I'm about to take you through those 16 slides that show you how to do this. Again, it's for your reference. Here's all those tools that we just discussed. These are all the icons for the tools. Around it, we're gonna establish guardrails. I know Eric, you were talking to me the other day about how important the guardrail stuff is um, and making sure that's put in. Um, automate as much as possible the account provisioning and make sure the security, the identity access, the rules, the uh, RBOC, right? Role-based access control, all that stuff gets in place and is set up correctly. And once all this happens, then you're gonna keep going around in a loop around this thing, managing it, because things will change. You'll have new people be added and people be leaving and you'll be changing policies and you'll have new compliance rules come in. So this is kind of a, a self-perpetuating uh, process. Did I say that well, Eric? Is that, is that a fair way of saying that? That's correct, yeah. Certainly. I mean, there are a lot of different tools and uh, can, you can go through the process of setting up the landing zone from scratch and creating the guardrails and so on. But uh, again, there are a lot of different options. So uh, again, as we're going to cover, uh, AWS has make it a little bit easier by in, including AWS Control Tower as a, a one-all assistant that can help you with the with the configuration of the of the elements right i'm, I'm going to tell you don't do it manual <laughs> it's a pain there's a lot to cover aws has given you this control tower system which just helps you do it amazingly well now again can't uh so number one first thing you do because these are kind of in order aws control tower so i'm going to go through these really quickly we don't have time to go in depth again i'm going to point these slides out to you um, because I've literally captured screen by screen showing you how to do this. There's information about what it is. There's an architectural diagram about how it's going to get set up, how it's going to set administrators, allowing you to set the landing zone, putting all this in. A couple of key things. You do need to have admin rights to do this. It doesn't let you know lower level people just spin up these things. There is a issue when you set this up, and I think I call it out on the next slide. So a couple of notes, control tower, you have to have the necessary permissions and, and control over the OUs within your organizational structure. Um, it does not extend governance to your existing OUs and accounts. So the idea is you don't necessarily want to apply this over the top of your production workloads. You want to build this separate, get it set up properly with all your rules and policies and compliance and cost accounting and then move things back over into it when you get that up and running. That's the best practice, that's the best way to do it. It is possible, it talks about re registering and enrolling, um, but it is possible to accidentally, if you don't pay attention to these notes and you don't do it right, you can lock yourself out of the account. Um, and I do have a slide, I think it's the next slide that talks about this. One other point is when you set up Control Tower, there are a few, um systems that have to be set up that do come with a teeny charge to them so if you for example log files you have to have log file storage you like to have uh, uh aws cloud trail and cloud watch and some of these other things we're not talking a lot of money but i don't want you to think it's completely free microsoft the exact same thing right if you want to run for example um you want to run some of the scripts you need to pay it's like two dollars a month for, for the storage tool that runs the log files that allow you to do some of the uh, Active Directory stuff. These are minor, minor, minor charges, but I wanna make sure you're aware they, they will charge you. And it'll tell you, it'll say, okay, this is gonna cost this amount of money, blah, 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 blah. You can always turn them off later, but they do need to be activated in order to get Control Tower working. And then this other point, this is really a, a um, uh, important this is what the screen looks like when you go through control tower and i've literally captured every single one of these screens and i put notes about them over here to teach you so it's going to talk about pricing it's going to ask you to pick which region in the aws system that is closest to you remember the closest is the least amount of uh um uh bandwidth that i'm going to need to get there um so I can get there fastest. It's also the lowest cost. The farther away you are, the more it costs to, to access these. There's this thing called region deny setting, and I made a special note here. Enabling region deny will prohibit current workloads from running. What this means is I take the entire region 
And if you set this thing to enabled and it warns you, it's gonna go make you go through multiple things to say you understand you're doing this. What it's gonna do is it's gonna say, I'm only going to allow well-governed, well-architected um, applications to flow through this particular region. So when you're first setting this up, turn this off because you don't wanna shut down all your production workloads. You're gonna turn this off until you build it up, till you get everything ready, and then you'll go back and you'll enable it. There's nothing wrong with leaving it off. You can even go out and set other regions. It's asking for additional regions. The idea of being well architected is once I get everything under control and I now feel I've patched all my security holes, I've got my costs under control, everything's working groovy, then I can turn it on and no one can spin up and create a non-governed instance. So I could sleep well at night because I know my entire network is now protected. It will enforce governance across everything. But the first time we do it, turn this off. Just set not enabled on. That's what I point out. Do not enable if you've already deployed workloads to this. Now, if you're starting from scratch, this is the first time you ever used it, turn it on and leave it on. That's fantastic. Uh, but you don't want to do this uh, if you already have a bunch of production workloads and they're out of control and their costs are out of control. If you enable it, it'll shut down access to those workloads until you come back and, and hit this button. So um, you can read about it. I'm, I'm making short work of this, but there's all kinds of documentation and information. It's not a big deal, but I did want to point it out because I didn't want someone to come back and say, my whole network shut off and it's not working. Okay, you enabled this accidentally. Two seconds, we can go back and, and turn it off and you're right back up where you were. Okay, and then page by page again, then you go into the next deal where you configure your OUs. Again, it's asking you questions as you go and based on what it's finding out as you answer these questions, give me the account that you wanna use for log files, give me the account you wanna do for auditing, who's the manager of this uh, system, how are you uh, gonna enable CloudTrail and S3? And so you're just gonna keep filling it out and putting this stuff in. There's also a breakout here. I added in slides for the uh, key encryption. So after this, we're not going to go to step five. We're going to go into the key uh, encryption steps, and I'll show you how you can make symmetric key encryptions, encrypting and decrypting. Again, I take you process by process. I changed the color to make sure you realize we're talking about keys here. Um, and you go through step by step. You'll see all this. I'm zipping through really fast. And then we get back after we add in the policies and they will give you um, actual code that you just copy and paste in case you're not a programmer, how you make these keys and how you adjust them. It'll tell you your keys created. So you would actually see your key number up there. And what you're gonna do is copy this key and then you'll paste it back in on the, on the KMS encryption. Once that key is created, you'll just paste that value back in. You'll see it down here. It says, okay, this is the encryption method I'm going to be using. Make sure you store this in a good place so you can come back and get it. This is going to encrypt my data as it flows through here so that if I ever get hacked or, or whatever, no one can, can review it. And then, or, or no one can get it. The last thing is, uh, this last step says review and create, and it shows me everything I filled out up to this point and make sure that everything looks good, acts good, et cetera. Once you hit the next button, it'll give you this blue screen. It says setting up your landing zone. And so it starts cranking and this will take upwards of an hour. The first time I did this, I sat there for an hour and I'm like, I still don't have anything. I, it's just sitting there doing nothing. I did not realize if you've never worked in Azure, or I'm sorry, in AWS again before, this is your first time, it will send you an email. And so I got a message from Amazon Web Service says, dear AWS customer, thank you for using. You recently requested, blah, blah, blah. You need to validate the request. So in other words, it is trying to say, you told me you are michael.o at fuji.com. Verify that that is you. And once you do, I'll let the thing run and do what it's supposed to do. I did not realize this. And so I sat there for hours waiting and finally, when I looked at my email, I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot, click, verified, and boom, the thing took off. So the whole process should only take at least an hour, uh, not much more than that. Uh, but look for this email if it's your very first time, because I, I wasted a lot of time not realizing it. When it all gets said and done, it comes back and looks nice and green like this and says your landing zone is now available. 
and then it'll take you step by step on what do you need to do. And the next thing you need to do is go in and start setting up and extending out your organizational units, get your policies in place, get your compliance in place, put your rules, your automation, tons of documentation show you how to do this. Um, and then when you're finally done, so this is the organizations, you're gonna set your budgets, you're gonna make sure all your licenses and the license manager helps you control and make sure you're licensed across everything. And that's not just AWS, that's your Microsoft license and your Autodesk license and anything else you might use. Um, they also have a, a lock to the marketplace with tons of great solutions out there that you can use. And then finally, you get to this well-architected tool, um, which will help you, again, build some of the uh, uh, different core components of all of this. Um, if you're doing DevOps, so you're doing a lot of programming, here's a bunch of tools that will help you in the DevOps space put all this together. Service Catalog is really awesome. You should definitely check out business users. And then finally, this is just going back to that same slide we had before, uh, systems manager, trusted advisor, cost usage report, cost explorer. I understand there's still a lot here. And I don't want you to freak out and go, okay, I'm not getting all this. There's like hundreds of these tools that I have to use. I get it. Um, with experience and with time, it'll start to become second nature. Those of you that have been using AWS for years, you're like, yeah, I got this. This is nothing, right? I like to see it laid out like this, but yeah, I understand. For those of you that are brand new, and remember I was one of you two, two months ago, it can be overwhelming. And again, this is where a partner can help. Use a third-party partner, call Fuji. We would love to, to sit there. And again, we can do the work for you, or we can just consult you through it and make sure that you make the right steps. Um, we also provide managed services, so we can actually manage the entire thing and, and, and own your security and own your day-to-day your -day operations. So keep that in mind as well. Where do I get more information? This is the end. I want to point this out. I showed this to you earlier. The AWS Architecture Center is a great resource. It'll show you other architecture. It'll show you best practices for security and keeping your costs down. Those quick start reference deployments are out there and tons and tons of case studies. I have barely cracked the surface of this thing. I spend so much time out here looking at stuff and it's easy to get lost because you look at one article and it points you to the next one and the next one and you just keep reading and reading and, and hopefully you absorb like a sponge, but there's quite a lot uh, out there. Eric, are there other resources you would point them to, or is that your favorite? What do you think? Uh, well, certainly, again, there are some events from uh, AWS. There's a, a skill builder, skill builder uh, site that AWS provides that has, again, training, detailed training on, on, on all the different areas. Uh, but again, again, AWS has over 200 services, so there's a lot of different resources that you can go by. And um, so, yeah, it's important to perhaps identify which ones are more uh, particular to your uh, your use case and your scenarios. Yep. And Mike, I do want to also mention that we did uh, receive a question from uh, Praval. Uh, it, the question was, can we propose HubSpoke model to every solution or is it per customer requirement based on small or big customer environment? Um, and sure, single point of entry and exit. Uh, I think, again, overall, it depends on the user. There's, there's uh, very few scenarios where you have a solution that works for everybody, right? Even if you're following a recipe and you're cooking food, you always need to have your special seasoning, right? So uh, it really depends on the scenario. Uh, but again, for the most part, best, the decisions should be driven by the, the uh, business needs and the requirements. So um, yeah, there's no cut all solution that will work for everyone. That's my, my take on it. I cannot believe Eric used a food reference right at lunchtime. So now everyone's thinking a <laughs> I'm just teasing. Hey, we are right at the end of our session and I apologize, I went long. I was worried this was gonna take a while because there's so much information. Um, we will follow up, we will send you all the slide deck. It's huge, so we have to send you a link to the slide deck, but you'll have this. There's speaker notes in there, et cetera. Um, so I wanna make sure and stay right at 12 o'clock right now. So those of you that have to leave, uh, thank you so much. As soon as you exit, by the way, there is a four question eval. And it basically says, how did I do as a presenter? How was the content? Would you recommend this to anyone else? We're not asking you to do it. We're just trying to see, would you be willing to do it? 
uh, that tells us if we did a good job or not. And then do you need Fuji to call you on any particular thing, again, to follow up on a technical question or whatever? So it'll take you all but two minutes tops to answer that. And it really helps me build the content the way uh, make sure we're on the right path. So please do that. If you still have questions because I screwed up and went long, I will stay long and we'll stick around and answer any questions. But for the rest of you, if you if you got your questions answered, go ahead, you can exit the, the presentation. Remember, we're doing these every two weeks. So come back and see us again. We hope you uh, enjoyed it. We hope you spread the word and bring others with you. And hopefully we'll see you again on another Fuji Connect. And with that, we'll go ahead and, and finish today. And then, as I said, we'll just hang around if there's any other questions for those that, that still have questions that need to be answered. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. So I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure out how to do that. And then are there other questions in the chat that we didn't get to? Maybe that's not the I case. I think it was one more question, sorry, uh, okay. from, uh, from Pavel. Yep. on uh, creating a landing zone. Uh, if it's a single account with uh, nothing in it, it, it won't take two hours. It will it will take less than an hour, uh, no. but it's still, um, basically the, the uh, control tower is creating, um, it's creating all the guidelines and all the different guardrails and everything, all the configuration. So there's still some processing that needs to happen, again, even if you're creating the account from scratch. But uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't take, uh, again, more than an hour. Uh, it should take less if you don't you don't have any any existing workloads. Yeah, but what you're saying is exactly right. Even if you have nothing, it still will take close to an hour. Uh, just because there's a lot of automation, there's multiple scripts that are running, and the way that the system control tower works is it has to finish script one before it goes to script two, before script three. So sometimes it just has a timer waiting to give it enough time to make sure that first one gets executed because it doesn't want to step over its previous steps. Azure does the exact same thing. Um, so sometimes you're just waiting on those wait timers to, to hit their mark before the next part of the code evokes. Um, but it's a one-time setup deal. You only have to do it once. And then once you do, you're set, you're good to go. And then you can go in and apply all the other uh, goodness that you learned today. Okay, any other questions that people have? Glad to answer. Uh, did one just come in? Rakvir KPS, how does it work through complex banking infrastructure? Do we answer that? I don't think we have. Running legacy um, OS software and databases, what would be operational efficiency like transactions per second? Can this framework be adopted? So, uh, so he's in the banking industry and he's asking about banking specific uh, infrastructure stuff. Yeah, I mean, banks and financial institutions rely a lot on legacy systems. And uh, again, there are a lot of different challenges that they experience, again, with migrating these uh, kind of systems. Um, and again, one, several reasons why they don't use something, again, more more current. Uh, there's also the factor of availability, because uh, especially if you're talking about a bank, you are not allowed to have any single downtime, right? You need to keep uh, be operational 100 uh, again 24/7, not not missing a single transaction, because that could be a, a potential uh, issue. So yeah, there are a lot of different uh, considerations to take uh, when dealing with with financial institutions. Um, for the most part, I think again the legacy systems they like to keep that again use the cloud as a um, as a backup. Because they wanna, they wanna own basically the, the major those large mainframes that uh, keep transactions information. But yeah, there's certainly a lot of advantages that they can take from the cloud still. So yeah. um, I was just gonna add one uh, thing, um, especially in financial institutions, there's a lot of compliance issues. Uh, um, what do they call it? Port of origination, port of destination, where your data has to stay local to your region. Um, if you're in India, for example, you cannot take your data and put it over in Germany. There are laws that prevent that. So those compliancy rules will um, uh, can be enforced on top of an AWS infrastructure to make sure that you don't accidentally violate some of those rules and regulations. Same thing for, for Azure, same thing for the other cloud solutions. Um, and then as we talked about the quick start, there are some quick starts, if I remember correctly, for financial institutions, yeah. So a, a lot of the same problems or 
or concerns that financial institutions have, they build them around that industry. You can start with those quick start guides and they'll kind of get you on the right path um, to make sure that from a financial perspective, you're setting everything up correctly. Um, June asked, uh, how does AWS work for Microsoft Office backup and recovery? I can talk about this one. So Office 365 is a cloud solution. It's part of Microsoft's cloud. When you save to Office 365, you're actually saving, believe it or not, to SharePoint, um, but you're saving in a new version of SharePoint that's called OneDrive. Um, and most people don't know this. SharePoint is OneDrive is Microsoft Teams. They're all the same product. They just have a different marketing name and kind of a different interface for customers, but they're all the same thing. They're literally the same source code that's been rebranded. Um, and I know this because I was at Microsoft and I helped kind of put all this stuff together. Um, so what that means, uh, June, is if you are saving in uh, your Office 365 account, it is saving to the Microsoft environment and it is not in danger ever of being deleted or destroyed or anything else because Microsoft is backing it up. Microsoft has a process where you can keep the file local and keep the file out in the cloud at the exact same time. And if your local copy gets destroyed, your laptop gets run over by a steamroller or something, I don't know what, um, it doesn't matter because the second you plug back in with a new machine, it'll realize your cloud copy is different than the local one, which you no longer have, and it instantly recreates your local one. Um, your question though is, can AWS do this? And the answer is yes, it can, right? You could set up similar redundant data and backup, uh, but the simple answer is you don't need to since you're already using Microsoft Cloud as part of your Office 365 license. By the way, I'm gonna do a deep dive technical discussion on this. I'm gonna show collaboration and how it all works on the Microsoft side. That's one of our future events. I think it's coming up in a couple of weeks, if I remember correctly. Uh, but check out the schedule and we'll go, we'll go deep, deep, deep. I'll do a lot more demo than I did today with the, the slide deck, um, but we'll show you how that exact process works. I see another question has come in. Yes, uh, we got another question from yeah. a uh, from Brian Johnson asking about adopting a multi-cloud architecture. Uh, and if that's the case, we should develop a, a landing zone for each cloud. Uh, and if there's any common or centralized management tools um, that will allow us to manage simultaneously. So basically you do need to create guardrails and, and rules in each of the clouds, because again, you don't want to have uh, basically each cloud, even though they offer similar services, each cloud provider has again, their own different version of uh, uh, limitations and guardrails and governance. So you still need to have a baseline uh, that you apply on each uh, cloud provider. and uh, there's also, I think, uh, Michael is going to have a session coming up on Core Stack, and uh, again, that's a, a tool that will communicate with the different clouds, and you can also have, uh, again, um, monitoring. You can have controls over what's going on, in and uh, overall looking at the configuration across all of the different clouds, and um, yeah, but that that will Core Stack will allow you to keep some sort of control as well on how the landing zone is going. So, but you do need to set it up on, on each of the clouds. Initially, yeah. again, have a baseline of the controls. Two weeks ago, I did the Azure version of this exact same presentation. And we showed, remember on the Microsoft side, they call it differently than AWS. They call it the cloud adoption framework, where on the AWS side, it's the well-architected framework. Um, the cloud adoption framework has in it a, a blueprint that anyone can run that will set up a landing zone. Matter of fact, if you look under the Google search, uh, Microsoft Enterprise Landing Zone, um, it'll pop up. Actually, I think I have it queued up just to show you what it looks like. So hold with me one second, cloud adoption framework, reference architecture. Uh, there we go. So this is the uh, enterprise scale landing zone in Azure. You just have to put Microsoft uh, enterprise landing zone and it'll pop up. What these are, are blueprints. And so you can go, for example, hub and spoke and click on this. And this thing is, is massive. I don't pick favorites between AWS and Microsoft. I, I know I put in almost 20 years at Microsoft and it's great and I love stuff, uh, but AWS is incredibly impressive. One little notch I will give in Microsoft's favor is this blueprint. 
This thing has 88 separate moving parts. It's more extensive than what you just saw on the AWS side. I'm not saying it's better. I'm just saying it's more extensive. It does more for you in automation than the AWS stuff does. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean it's better. It just means it's a little more involved and intrinsic. So this thing will ask you 88 separate questions. You can see 88 different resources are gonna be deployed. It's the same thing. It starts asking you, and you can already tell, I mean, look at all the questions it asks in very detail, where when we went through the control panel or the, the control tower, it just asks a couple of key questions, and then you still have to do a little bit more manual work. That's the only edge I'm going to give to, to Azure is I do think this blueprint's a little more extensive. Um, if you want to, we're going to be rerunning that event. Matter of fact, just this morning, our our CTO said, hey, we got to rerun it again. We got a lot of customers that were excited about it, didn't get a chance to see it. I will make one last blank statement on this, which is if you're a, a good sized company, right? If you're an enterprise related company, uh, Veronica's on the call, uh, you can talk to her. If you need to, we'll run one of these events for free for you. Uh, if you say, man, I wish my boss had seen this and my executives had seen this, this is really important. If it's important to you, it's important to us. And and given the right circumstances, we won't do it for teeny little organizations, but for, for decent sized organizations, reach out to Veronica, reach out to myself, and we will be glad to set one up just for your individual organization. We'll take you through it in case you don't want to wait another two months till we come back around to that topic. So I just want to make sure everyone realized that's an option that's available as well. Okay, I see no more questions in the queue. I loved these questions. The last time we did this, not many people asked many questions. <laughs> I was really worried, uh, but I'm very happy that you guys got vocal and, and got your answers to your questions. Uh, I'll check one more time. I don't see anything else. I think we're at the end. 